I'm Father Michael Orsi. I'm your host for Action for Life Television, that good news program which brings you the big G for the gospel of Jesus Christ and little G, all the good things that people do to put that gospel of life into action. Well, one of the things that we're sure about when it comes to the gospel is that uh, we are called to evangelize. You know what that means? To tell other people the good news about Jesus. A lot of times people think, oh, that's the job of the priests. They're the only ones that do that. That's the job of the ministers. They're the ones that do that. Uh-uh, uh-uh. It's everybody's job to tell people about Jesus Christ. It's everybody's job to bring the gospel to the world. It's God's word. And when we see Jesus, it is the fullness of God's revelation. It goes out to all the world and it tells people not just about Jesus, which is fantastic, but it talks about us, who we are and what our relationship to Jesus must be in order that we must be saved. That's what it's all about, evangelization to help save other people by bringing the good news. Now, a lot of people have never heard it. They, they never heard it or they haven't heard it clearly or they just tune people out. They might say, oh, that's for old people or, oh, that's for superstitious people or, oh, you don't need that anymore. After all, our secular society has the answers to everything. We can make everybody happy. You know that that's a lot of, I'm going to use a technical term here now, folks. It's a lot of baloney, a lot of baloney. It's a technical term, okay? We have a really an interesting person here today. He's going to talk about a very interesting organization. Interesting person is Mr. John Bishop, and he is the director of formation of people <laughs> in an organization called Focus. Focus. Now, we're going to ask John. Welcome, John. Welcome, welcome. What is Focus? It's good to be here. Thank you for having me on today. I oh, it's it. a pleasure. I like to talk to people that talk about the good news. But what, what's Focus? Yeah, so Focus stands for the Fellowship of Catholic University Students. And we're an organization that's been around since the, the 98, 99 academic year, so just a little over 20 years old. Um, and what we do is, uh, is I guess what you're talking about, Father, evangelization. We do that full time. Uh, so we've grown from an organization of two to right around a thousand full time employees um, in the last 20 years. And we take it as our mission to go onto college campuses, um, one of the places where the, the Catholic Church is losing um, more souls than anywhere else. We go onto college campuses. Uh, to evangelize young men and young women, bring them into the Catholic faith, um, set them on mission for the rest of their lives to do the same for others. Okay, so you're dealing with young people who are your missionaries, right? Missionaries, yes? Uh, well, yes and no. Okay. So we have, uh, what, what Focus does, that's a good question, Father, is we work with, with young people um, to evangelize other young people. Um, so let me explain. Like I said, Focus right now has, has, has roughly 1,000 full-time staff members, the vast majority of whom are on-campus full-time missionaries. So what those folks are doing is all day, every day, they're uh, going onto college campuses and having conversations with young people, starting Bible studies, walking with young men and women, having you know getting coffee with, with anybody who will listen to them to talk about the good news of Jesus Christ. Okay, so, so wait a minute. So this is... This is yeah. young people who you form. You're the formation director. You form them right. to go out into the college community. And right. they then go out and they bring the good word to the members of the college community. That's yes. right. Okay, now, first of all, I want to know, First of all, they, they go out there and they tell everybody about the organization, what they do. So that's the way you get people involved, right? You bring new people in. That's right. All right. Yeah. So you bring new people in and you now are the director of formation, right? What do you do to form these people so that they too can be uh, missionaries or evangelizers? 
Yeah, so that's a that's a big question, and it's one uh, that me and my other colleagues in formation here at Focus think about every day. So um, let me tell you a little bit about our method of, of evangelization. Yeah, well, I know the method. How do you do this? Yeah, and then I, and then I'll tell you a little bit about how we form people for that method. But these are exactly the right questions, Father. So I appreciate you. See, I'm a genius. See, ladies and gentlemen, John is proving to you what I've been telling you over these many years. I'm just a genius. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so much. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so let me, let me tell you a little bit about the method. Um, so at Focus, we say um, that we do evangelization in such a way that, that follows Christ's example. Okay, so our founder, Curtis Martin, um, has a nice turn of phrase where he says, uh, we practice the method modeled by the master. Okay, we practice the method modeled by the master when we're out and doing evangelization. And what that means is that we at Focus um, try to invest in a few people, deeply invest in a few people to bring those people into the faith, um, build them up, form them, if you will, um, over the course of, of years to then make those few evangelists um, as well to go out and do the same for others. Okay, but okay. how long does it take to form somebody? I mean, it, at the seminary, it took them uh, about four or five years to form me and as you can see, it didn't work too good, but they did the best they could, you know? Yeah, yeah that's, a good, that's, a, that's a good question, Father. There's, there's an answer and there's not an answer to that question. So we have seen in many instances, young men and young women come into our, our apostolate and within a year be able to go out and evangelize others. Now, some of those young men and young women come from incredible Catholic families, and in a sense, they've been formed for decades already. Some of them are just naturally very virtuous people who pick up the faith very quickly. Um, others take a little bit more time. <laughs> and so sometimes somebody comes in and, and they're, they're interested in the faith. In fact, they're, they're even to, willing to give their lives completely to Christ right away. But they're just so broken that it takes years before they're really at a point where they could go and model the Christian life in any meaningful way for anyone else. Now, Christ loved those people. Um, a lot of those people are the people that Christ spent a lot of time with, um, but they might not quite be ready to go out and evangelize others until they build some virtuous habits, until they, um, you know, uh, build up the, the sort of the requisite amount of virtue to, to have what we call on the college campus, we call it moral authority, or the, the ability to kind of demonstrate by one's life um, uh, the, uh, the things which, which one is preaching. But how, you do you, know? how do you nurture this? I mean... Virtue, I mean, like you said, you gotta you gotta build virtue. It's usually you know by good example, by repetition, uh, by study. How do you how do you do this? And of course, you know, uh, by grace. Look, gang, without God's grace, you're not gonna build any virtue. You're not gonna build any virtue. You might be a nice guy, nice woman, something like that. Without God's grace, you're not gonna build the virtue that you need. The virtue that you need to be a role model for the gospel. Am I right? Plain and simple. Father. There you yeah, go. Obviously, you know, we, we, I use the raft analogy sometimes when I'm um, explaining the idea of virtue um, to, to focus missionaries. I say, hey, so there's two parts um, growing in virtue. Um, your own effort is part of it. It really matters. But you're not even going to get off the ground save through God's grace. So I use the analogy. I just say, fundamentally, every young man and every woman, every man, woman, period, um, is in the position of being of drowning in their sin. That without Christ, there is no salvation for anyone. And ultimately, you can't act your way into it. There's nothing that you can do that can merit uh, that salvation um, in, in terms of your own works. Okay. So we we require the grace of Christ, and so it's kind of like you're drowning out in the ocean. Christ gives you a, you know, a, um, a, a raft, you know, a, a sort of life preserver for you to grab onto. Okay, um, you are lost without the grace of Christ, but you are also lost if you're unwilling to grab on. But there's, there's this is sort of a, you know, a, a grace and a, and a human participation in the saving. You got you to say yes. You got to say yes to Christ. Yeah. See, ladies and gentlemen, you know, God is Jesus has given you all the grace. God has given you all the grace that you need. He's saying here, here, here it is. But you got to say yes and grab on to it. I mean, you know, he gives you the gifts, but you have to accept the gift. 
Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So accepting the grace of Christ, you know, united with Mary in the Annunciation, be it done unto me according to thy word, is essential for growth and virtue. But let's get a little practical here as well. So you have a young man, young woman on a college campus wanting to grow in virtue. What do you do? Uh, well, let me give it, you know, one big piece of advice right from the outset. The mysteries of the gospel are oftentimes realized in the context of community. Okay, that again, the mysteries of the gospel are oftentimes realized in the context of community, and this is especially the case for young people. It's, it's, it's true throughout life, but it's especially true for young people. If young people are going to grow, bringing the message of the gospel into their lives, making it real, allowing themselves to be changed by the Lord's grace, they oftentimes need to do it with other people really difficult to live the Christian life alone. It can indeed be done. And in history, we've seen many great saints who have done so. But if you want to kind of stack the deck and help people to grow, especially the young, then really what you're trying to do is you're trying to create a hotbed Christian community um, in which others will play off one another and grow in virtue. So do they live? Do they live together? Is there a dormitory set up? Is there? What do you have? A meeting house that they come from different places? How does this work? All of the above. So it varies from campus to campus. You have places, for example, like St. John's Newman Center um, at the University of Illinois, or some of the really well-established Newman centers throughout the country. So let me just explain to the folks. Folks, a Newman Center is named after Cardinal Newman, and. Uh, these Newman centers are set up usually in non-Catholic colleges, and they're a place where Catholic students can go. They can go for mass, confession. Also, they can receive uh, catechizing. That means teaching them the ways of faith and also study groups, Bible study, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, so that the uh, Catholic community is served in these Newman centers. And they do a fantastic job. They really do. I'm very high on, on the Newman centers. Also, they're a great source of vocations, especially to the priesthood. Go ahead, John, because you're, you're helping with this work. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, yeah. so focus oftentimes is working right alongside a Newman center. Um, We'll take, you know, anywhere between four and 10 of our full-time staff. That's, you know, those, those on-campus missionaries that I was talking about earlier. And they'll work right in and around the context of a Newman Center. Um, what you'll see more often than not is kids living, you know, going in and renting houses together. Um, you'll see them, you know, uh, getting apartments and, you know, you know, taking over different parts of a, of a college dormitory and living in community in that way. But even if they're not, um, literally living together, then what you're trying to do is you're making hubs of community, you know, uh, oftentimes around a Newman Center, you know, you're throwing parties, you're, you're, you're uh, you know, um, getting students together so that they become friends with one another. Um, oftentimes in these informal scenarios that the real work of evangelization is done. Okay, so at Focus, we say that we practice the little way of evangelization in hopes that that leads to spiritual multiplication. Let me put that down for you a little bit here. The little way of evangelization, what does that mean? Well, the little way of evangelization um, might be likened to accompaniment to college students. So oftentimes the missionaries that we send on college campuses are young men and young women in their 20s, age 23 through, through 27, 28, 29, somewhere in there. There are some older and some a little bit younger, but that kind of average age for a focused mission. That missionary will go and live in close proximity, usually to a Newman Center or some sort of Catholic center on campus, um, and then go out onto the college campus and really just try and strike up relationships. Um, you know, focus missionaries are known, you know, for going into the fraternities, into the sororities, into the college bars, and just picking up conversations with whomever that's willing to speak to them um, at first just to become friends. Sometimes a focused missionary won't lead with you know, the, uh, uh, an explicit proclamation of the gospel. Won't lead, you know, with 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 talking about Christ first thing. But hey, we're having a party, you know, over at the, uh, you know, at my house this coming Friday night. Would you be willing to come to the party? Somebody comes to the party, you take them the next step, the next step. You know, next you have coffee, you go from there, and eventually you're in the you're you are operating within the context of relationship. 
introduce that person to the saving message of Jesus Christ. You can talk to that person about their need, you know, for the gospel, about the fact that we're all going to die. In this world, this broken world, we all need a savior. And that nothing that we can do can close that infinite gap, you know, the separation that was caused by sin for Christ. But if you're willing to accept the message, you know, the message of Christ, then he transform your life and you can become a saint through his grace. Okay, so you uh, gradually you gradually introduce someone into uh, the focus community. You gradually introduce them into the community. You don't whack them over the head with the Bible, uh, but you become friends. You just begin to build relationships. Uh, bridges are built. Okay, then is there a point where you say, this one has a lot of potential. You know, they, they, I guess the one of the signs is they keep coming back, right? right? And then you say, this one has some potential. And then are they nurtured throughout uh, a, a period of time? As you said, it could be a year, it could be two years. But how do they get their credentials to be a focus missionary? Do you give them a, like a diploma? You passed, uh, you're ready. How do you do this? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. So usually it works like this: when when we're working on with a student on campus, um, then they'll hit a certain point in their progression where we think, you know what? I think they're ready to receive what's called a high call. Okay, a um, high the high call. So high, high like call. Mouth, okay, and then a call like a calling. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's 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 a high call to participate more deeply in the mission of focus. Now, these folks won't necessarily become full-time missionaries. Um, it, uh, they begin just by being students on campus who are passionate about proclaiming the gospel and inviting others, you know, into this method of evangelization, okay? So they'll receive a high call. Now, students might serve with us just as students for several years, and then eventually they'll get to a point where they've completed their own degree, um, and uh, we'll say, hey, you know, um, it's been incredible the things that we've seen you do on campus. It, it seems like maybe you should consider coming on with us full time. We invite them to an interview weekend. They go through some psychological screening screenings and, you know, a number of different um, sort of, you know, hoops that they have to jump through before they would eventually then be given an offer to serve as a full time focused mission. Full time missionaries make a minimum two year commitment to the organization. Uh, many of the people listening to this radio show have probably talked to missionaries. This before. is not radio. This is live television. Oh, sorry. Great. What yeah, I, I mean, seen? you look so good. <laughs> I wouldn't put you on the radio. I mean, I can only hear yeah, you. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you know, and, and, and you know, people, you know, in, in my audience, they like to see me uh, three times a week, eight thirty Eastern time on Tuesday, eight thirty Thursday Eastern time, and four o'clock on Sunday. I mean, gang, you know this, but I have to, you know, I have to tell John about this. That way he can watch too. Okay, continue. I mean, <laughs> that was, a, that was a commer an unpaid commercial. Okay. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you for, for catching me there, Father. Uh, but a uh, minimum two year, two year commitment to be a focused missionary. These folks, I mean, they're on fire. Uh, you you want to talk about passion for evangelization. If you want to serve as a focused missionary, um, you actually have to go and fundraise 100% of your salary. So we don't even pay them. We just say, hey, you want to do focus? We'd like for you to do focus too. Um, what you've got to do is you got to go and ask 30, 40, maybe 50 people to give you a certain amount every month so you can support yourself um, and go and give yourself 100% of the time to evangelization. Hey, hey folks, this, you know, this is a revelation. This is serious stuff now. You sign up for two years and then you got to pay your own salary. You know, I... I don't know if I could make it in that deal when I was like in college, something like that. I mean, uh, I was, uh, the Italians have an expression. It's called morta avam. I was starved to death in college. I don't know if I could do this. But, all right, so good. So they make their own money and they pay themselves. Yeah, and I like your starved to death point there, Father, as well. So if you- I tell you, you folks, I, you see, with my facility with languages, that, that's called, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm talking, uh, well, I, I don't think it's what you call- um, High class Italian. I think it's kind of, um, well, kind of lower class Italian. But I won't tell you the rest of the stuff that I know in Italian. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to hear the what I know in Italian. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But we, you know, so we talk about, you know, the mysteries of the gospel re being realized in the context community. Here's a, here's a tip um, that applies for, uh, for certainly for missionaries in the college context. 
but really for everyone. Um, so if, if you're a focused missionary, um, and say you're trying to get connected with, with young men in particular, um, uh, you want to grow in relationship with them. Eventually, you want to introduce them to the gospel, um, to Christ's church. Well, there's one surefire way to get college students to show up for something, and that's to provide a bunch of free food. That, that might have worked for me. But the, yeah. <laughs> the two years, you know, of begging, I don't know. But go ahead. I mean, you got to respect these people. You got to respect them. This is fantastic. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Father. So, um, but I think that, you know, there's something to be gleaned from that um, for all of us. So uh, my wife and I go to a parish here um, in, in uh, outside Denver, Colorado, Light of the World Catholic Church. And we're trying to get more people from our community um, to, uh, to, to come back to church. Okay, there's a lot of fallen away Catholics in our area, just like there's a lot of fallen away Catholics all over the country. And so uh, just yesterday, um, we said, you know what? We just we just gotta throw we just gotta throw a party. Imagine producing this wonderful program, Action for Life. It costs a great deal of money. We're going to need your help. So if you would like to donate to keep this good news program on the air, please, please go to your computer, your cell phone, actionforlife.net. Our thought for the day, I hope that all of you have Bibles in your home. The Bible is the Word of God. and There's nothing more powerful than God's Word. Keep it in a prominent place to remind you that you are part of God's good news and that God is using you to do His will. Yeah, so we just got to talk to all the lapsed Catholics in our area, and we just got to see if they're willing to come and, and, and just be with us. You know, and so we, we, you know, we, we got the party together. We got a few other very devout families from the parish as well said, hey guys, um, let's all of us get together. Um, let's throw a great big party and let's get as many lapsed Catholics in this area uh, to come and participate in the party as we possibly can. That kind of stuff is usually the springboard for evangelization. You know, just getting people together. The mysteries of the gospel are realized in the context of community. And so sometimes I think that if we really want to be evangelists, we have to be masters of creating communities. So it, if we, if we don't have anything to invite people into, you know, um, then, then, then how are we to evangelize? Say, you know, hello, hello, Bobby. Hello, Sally. I'd really like to, you know, to tell you about Christ, to introduce you to Christian living, to, to show you how to live as a Christian. Le- oh, but, but wait a second. I have nothing to invite you into. Okay. Uh, yeah. You want to invite, you want to invite them into something and uh, the something is really fantastic and great, but there are so many issues today, especially young, among young college people, uh, especially the issues of, of sexuality. Uh, aren't you talking like a foreign language to a lot of them? They say, well, what? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I'll tell you what, you know, so Focus was founded a little over 20 years ago. But the world that we're evangelizing today is a different world, even than 20 years ago. I mean, certainly than 40 years ago, certainly than 60 years, so on and so forth. And it's a world that we see becoming increasingly secular. It's a world that we see drifting further and further away from the church, especially in the areas of sexuality. So what do we do? Well, we have a few tools that we found to be really helpful. Uh, perhaps the foremost of those is John Paul II's Theology of the Body. Um, we have a, a resource, if you Google Focus Theology of the Body, um, you can uh, see a Bible study resource that we put out there that is a, is, is a great kind of conversation guide. Folks, I want to just tell you about... Uh... Theology of the Body. It's written by the late Pope John Paul the Great. Fantastic Pope. Uh, you can get this online. And you know, a lot of our people, our folks out there are not Catholic. Uh, you're Christians, uh, any denomination. 
maybe no denomination at all, but I would suggest that you read this. It applies to every human being, every human being, even if you have no religion at all, it'll tell you how to live, how to live a good life, how to live a, a, a life of, um, of, of um, how can I say it? A virtuous life and a, a life that's worthy of being emulated by other people, especially when children, young people see you living this kind of a life, using your sexuality in the proper way, in the proper context. Okay, so they get a chance to look at uh, John Paul. This was a great yeah. pope. So look at John Paul. Let me kind of point out one particular move that John Paul makes in Theology of the Body that would apply and not only for you know, discussions about theology of the body, but just about the topic of sexuality more broadly, okay? What we need to do to flip this narrative on its head, the world tells a narrative, the world tells a story that Christianity is negative when it comes to the body and sex, that it's unexciting, you know, that it's puritanical. Um, the Christians are sort of just a, you know, a, a group of prudes that um, want nothing, you know, to do with this, this passionate, you know, physical love, which is human sexuality. The move that theology of the body makes is to flip that narrative on its head. And regardless of whether or not you do, you use theology of the body, this is the move that you got to make. You got to turn things positive. You have to show that Christianity is contrary to, to being something, something down on sex is in fact the institution you know, the, the, you know the, the message of Christ is the message which paints sexuality more positively. You see, folks, positively, that's what Christianity is all about, and so is human sexuality. John, wonderful. I know you're for action. I'm for action, and I hope you are too. We would like to thank our generous sponsors for their wonderful support. Thanks for watching. Please join us next time for Action for Life. I'm for action and I hope you are too. I'm Father Michael Orsi. I am your host for Action for Life Television, that good news program which talks about the gospel of Jesus Christ, the big G and the little G, all the good things that people are doing to put the gospel of life into action. So please join us for the next episode of Action for Life.